Gregory Allen Williams is perhaps best known for his role on uh, the TV show Baywatch, where he plays Sergeant Ellerbee. But he's also a Shakespearean trained actor and served in the Marine Corps. He's also a real life hero, having saved the life of a man in the LA riots. And he's recently written his memoirs titled A Gathering of Heroes. Mr. Williams, I'd like to present you on behalf of the Heroes in Training program with these pictures for the previously interviewed cast of Baywatch. David Charvet. Mm -hmm and Nicole Eggert. Grand. And here are the certificates and hero cards to go with them. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, the first question I'd like to ask you, in keeping in the vein of heroism, uh, I know as we've interviewed different people through the course of this program, what comes up often is that the real heroes are parents, and especially single parents. I know that you were raised by a single mother. Uh, could you give me your thoughts on parents as heroes? Well, I, I think that heroism can often be defined as a, as a commitment fulfilled over the long haul, steady, constant. And I think parenting requires that kind of uh, heroism. Uh, we often think of heroes as being extraordinary people, people who accomplish great feats. But when you consider paying the rent or the mortgage on a regular basis, keeping groceries in the refrigerator, keeping the utilities on, the gas and the lights and so on and so forth, um, putting bandages on wounds, uh, putting love and kind words on uh, hurts of the heart, uh, those are ongoing commitments and I think that uh, that is heroism and I think if we look at our parents we'll find heroism very, very close to home. Okay, could you tell me a little bit about the events uh, in the L.A. riot? Tell me what happened. Well, uh, I went to the intersection of Florence and Normandy in hopes of being a voice of reason um, to th those few individuals there who were committing acts of violence against uh, strangers, but strangers who were human beings and fellow Americans. But when I arrived, um, Brown Ford Bronco pulled into the intersection and uh, debris struck the vehicle from almost every corner. The driver stops, uh, people ran out to the vehicle and uh, began beating the driver inside. The driver turned out to be a Japanese American man by the name of Takao Harata. I was standing on the uh, southwest corner and as he slumped forward unconscious I moved into the crowd and uh, was able to get him out of the truck, and as I pulled him from the truck, I was joined by a Mexican-American law student named Jorge Gonzalez, who moved uh, to intervene on our behalf to help us out, and he was struck and knocked to the ground and kicked and beaten. And his uh, assault, <coughs> or I should say his intervention, served as a diversion, uh, and I believe the folks who struck him were about to strike my, myself and Mr. Harata again. So. I was able to get Mr. Harada uh, down the street uh, where other neighbors uh, in the neighborhood intervened and summoned a passing police cruiser and uh, brought a paper towel to wipe his wounds and uh, asked me to set him down on, on, uh, on their grass and uh, folks came along and asked if they could take him to the hospital and finally he was taken to the hospital by an African American man in a van uh, and uh, at that point he was bleeding from I believe it was his uh, left ear, uh, and um, that signaled to me that he was hurt very badly, and had it not been for that man who took him to the hospital, Mr. Harata may, may well have died. Well, saving that man's life, uh, I'm sure everyone agrees, certainly a heroic act, and makes you a hero. But when we talked earlier, you said a few things that I thought were very interesting. You said that uh, that was your responsibility to act like that. And you also said that it was a selfish thing. No question. Uh, we ask a, that, that, oh, that proverbial question, am I my brother's keeper? Uh, what is my responsibility to another human being? Uh, Dr. King uh, told us that we are tied in a single garment of destiny. And whatever affects one directly affects one indirectly. Uh, Mr. Hemingway quoted another writer saying, never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Uh, some folks talk about karma. Uh, 
Other folks say what goes around comes around. Some folks say you reap what you sow. In every culture, there is uh, uh, some sort of uh, saying that suggests that you, that you get back what you put out. Uh, if that is so, then it is in my best interest to look out for my neighbor. Um, as Americans, we have uh, throughout our lives taken a pledge to preserve liberty and justice for all. Uh, the day Mr. Harada was beaten, his liberty was stolen. Liberty in this instance defined as security of person. The right to go to and from one place to another, unmolested, unafraid, and so on. It is then, as an American, I've taken the pledge, made the oath, that I would preserve liberty and justice for all. It is then my responsibility as an American to do that when I can and, and wherever I can. Uh, the promise of democracy is fulfilled person to person. The uh, principles of the Constitution are honored person to person. Uh, and, and so it is with the Bill of Rights. Um, if I wish to demand justice, then I must be willing to preserve justice for others. So does it all come back to the golden rule? Yes, and that's why it's golden, <laughs> because it is universal. Do unto others as you would have them. Certainly, were I in a vehicle at an intersection, being beaten. I would have others <laughs> do unto me as I did unto Mr. Harata. I would have someone, if it was in my power to mesmerize someone, come rescue me, I would do that. I would want that. I would need that. I would require that. So then, um, with Mr. Harata, I did unto him what I would have others. Isn't that just one of the greatest parts of human nature, though, that we are willing to help? It is one of the parts of our nature. Our natures are varied. We are as capable of great acts of compassion as we are uh, horrible acts of intolerance and, of course, indifference. So our natures are varied. And that is one of the things that I have to come to accept. There's a bit of bad in the best of us and a bit of good in the worst of us. I must be on guard for those aspects of my nature that are not compassionate. I must be on guard for my racist nature, which is brought about by my fearful nature, afraid that I'm not going to get something I want or I'm going to lose something I've got. Um, our lives, generally speaking, are shot through with fear. We don't see it as fear because it manifests itself as anger, righteous indignation, and we don't acknowledge it that it's really fear-based. I'm afraid of these people, of this person, because they might take something away from me or they might prevent me from getting something that I need or my children from getting something they need and that sort of thing. So we have to be on guard for those ugly things in our nature and be willing to accept them and embrace them as being a part of our nature. Uh, when you saw the man being attacked, it would have been easy, pr probably the easiest thing to do, to just walk on by. And earlier we talked about um, possibly what makes a hero is that the great people we've talked about, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, mm -hmm. uh, they have the strength to overcome the desire to conform and stand up for what they believe in. At Jefferson, Franklin, Madison, Hale, great men all, likewise, Robert E. Lee. <laughs> all of these men, uh, men who uh, made choices, uh, difficult choices, it certainly would have been easier to acquiesce to uh, the rule, the king's rule, for learned men of property, as Mr. Jefferson was a learned man of property. Uh, would have been easier. He could have gotten his perks and, and 
even to become a wealthier man. But he went against the grain. He chose liberty. Malcolm X also chose liberty. His father was murdered by the mob. His mother died of, of grief induced, uh, or madness induced by grief. She lost her mind. He too opted for liberty. Martin Luther King opted for liberty. Robert E. Lee opted for what he felt was liberty, you see. The right to choose, to make choices. All of these men, great American patriots. Uh, being a patriot is not necessarily going along with what the government thinks is right, but going along, uh, going, uh, going for what one thinks is best for the, for the people. There is also a thing, an issue of honor. I'm an ex-Marine, and you know, I was taught that honor was being willing to die, and often dying, that that was the ultimate sacrifice, that the ultimate sacrifice was not how you lived, but how you died. I'm not sure exactly how I feel about that, but if I consider myself an honorable man, then how in the name of heaven can I stand in the face of another man who is being deprived of his liberty and call myself an honorable man, which is another reason why the act was selfish. I could not, how could I look my son in the eye, how could I talk to anyone about honor, having stood in, front, in, in the face of a man being beaten to death and not made a move? How could I call myself a man? Now I could lie to you and I could lie to me, but I'm not comfortable with that, with lying to myself. So as I stood there and watched Mr. Harata slump forward, I'm saying to myself, <laughs> well, first of all, buddy, if you don't do something, you're going to have to live with this dishonor. Nah, don't want to do that. Uh, so um, I moved forward to preserve my honor. And, you know, I know that in this day and time, honor is not a politically correct kind of term or attitude, but one thing I've learned about living is, is you take what is good from your experiences, what you can use, and leave what you can't. Um, rarely should we write an experience off wholesale. There's much good that we can take from even things that may be a bit unpleasant. And one of the things that I took from the Marine Corps was the concept of duty and the concept of honor and faithfulness. Uh, you talked about Jefferson, you talked about all the great Americans, mm -hmm. and is it fair to say that this is really a country founded by heroes? I mean, the American dream is the dream to desire freedom. You have the right to freedom. Mm -hmm. and no one can deny you your freedom. Mm -hmm. And these heroic men set all this up so people today can live with that. And so you knew that you had to step in. They set it up, but they were short-sighted. Mr. Jefferson himself um, demanded liberty for himself, but was unwilling to preserve liberty for the black folks who he owned. There's a bit of bad in the best of us, and a bit of good in the worst of us, and the humanity in all of us. Short-sightedness, misunderstanding, a failure to see the forest for the trees. Here on one hand, Mr. Jefferson demands justice for himself and is unwilling to preserve justice for other human beings. Now, one can say that, well, he really, he really didn't make a mistake because he didn't consider black people to be his equal. He considered them to be beasts. Well, if that's the case, why did Mr. Jefferson then have so many black children? Why did he sleep with one of his black slaves if she was a beast, an animal? <laughs> you see. Well, I'm not going to condemn Mr. Jefferson. He, I'm as flawed as he is. I might suffer from the same kind of short-sightedness. But because one has flaws, because one fails, does not make one less heroic. It perhaps makes them more heroic because we see in the face of their failings, in the face of their shortcomings, they still were able at moments to rise to pinnacles of greatness. If we look for perfect heroes, there will always be disillusionment, won't there? No there will be no heroes. If perfection is a requisite uh, for heroism, there are 
No, there will be. There are no heroes. It is often, however, a person's flaws that inspire us. As I, as I mentioned, that if a person, if a man or a woman can achieve great things, and by great we mean, remember, that consistent, steadfast kind of commitment to purpose and to our own lives and to the lives of others. If we can maintain that, even in the face of our fear and our anger and our short-sightedness, then we are, we are truly heroes. Do you think of yourself as a hero? Mm -mm. No. Yesterday's scores will not win today's ball games. If the Padres go out and win on Tuesday, and they've got a game on Thursday, and when they hit the field, they say, well, you know what, folks, we won Tuesday. So <clears throat> the fans will say, but today's Thursday, you see. So the, my actions at the intersection of Florence and Normandy will not hold me today in the face of a different injustice, of a new injustice, in the face of new victims and new perpetrators and new mobs and new bystanders, you see. Heroism is, is commitment, it's steadfast, it's, it's, it's ongoing. Perhaps all that's required to rush into the midst of a mob is a rush of adrenaline. I have a firefighter friend named Newman. I asked Newman one time, what requires greater, which requires greater courage? Rushing into a burning building or taking care of your family one day at a time? He said, oh, most certainly taking care of my family. And he was the one who said rushing into a burning building may require some degree of skill, but primarily it's about a rush of, a rush of adrenaline. But the compassion that is required as a husband, a wife, a father, friend, teacher, disciplinary, that, my friend, is where the struggle is. When you want to go bowling, you know, but, but it's, it's, it's a bizarre night at the kids' grade school, <laughs> you know, but this is your big bowling night. What do I do? You know, do I go and be with this child who will probably not remember this, you know, or do I go bowling? That is where our heroism comes in, our willingness to commit. So we need to be able to see the difference between true heroism and heroic acts? There is heroism in, in certainly in heroic acts. I guess what I'm saying is, is that we, we can find heroism in other than extraordinary acts. Or because I think that the daily commitment and fulfillment of a commitment is, an ex is extraordinary. As I became an adult and realized what was required <laughs> to be an honorable adult, I realized. And I, 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 oh, goodness gracious, I tried to avoid it. I mean, I tried all kinds of ways because it was like, oh, my goodness, you know, this adult thing, this responsible thing, this is, you know, let me hang out and you know, party. You know. Um, but there's definitely heroism. But we need to look in other places because as long as we say that heroism is an extraordinary act of courage or bravery at great risk to oneself, to one's physical self, for example, then I can deny my responsibility to other people because I can say, oh, well, that guy was very strong, he was very brave, he was very courageous, and I'm not very brave, and I'm not very strong. So I could never do what he did. I could never be a hero. And so that allows people then to disassociate themselves from their responsibility to other people. If they come to believe that that responsibility requires great bravery, great courage, great strength, you see, then people can say, oh, they can distance themselves and say, well, no, I don't have to raise my voice in the face of mob violence because that man who did was strong and tall, you see, so I don't have to do that. But the truth is that we all must raise our voice in the face of the mob. Uh, I believe that no matter what the age of a person, I mean, people say that teenagers lose their respect for heroes, adults lose their respect for heroes, but I think that we're always searching for a hero, someone to pattern our life after. So who do you feel would be the best hero today? I, I call my book, A Gathering of Heroes, because I think that's what we require. A gathering of heroes. And those folks come in all 
different forms. Sometimes they enter our lives for only a, a brief moment, a passing moment, a word, a phrase. Um, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. I wonder how many soldiers in the Second World War remembered Mr. Roosevelt's words in battle. There's nothing to fear but fear itself when they were scared to death. So for some, see that's a moment, you know, we, of, of someone we say, oh, that's a hero, I, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, here's a man who uh, once vital and healthy found himself in a wheelchair but yet he, he kept pushing. So perhaps that was inspirational to people and they saw uh, Mr. Roosevelt as being a hero uh, in, his, uh, in his life. There's a gathering of heroes in our lives, all kinds of different folks I think who come in and I think it's best for us to be pragmatic. If we say, I'm gonna pattern my life after this person, the moment we see imperfection, then what happens to the pattern? You see, uh, my mother sews. And I remember when I was little, we used to go to J.C. Penney and she used to get a pattern. And she would make that dress based on that pattern. If the pattern was messed up, the dress would be messed up. I guarantee you that any human being that you pattern your life after will be imperfect. Therefore, the pattern will be messed up. So what one wants to do, perhaps, is to take from a variety of experiences, situations, and people and create their own pattern for your own life. You see, take a little bit from Bob, a bit from Bill, a little bit from Ellen. A little bit from Susie, a little bit from Confucius, a little bit from Roosevelt, a little bit from Kennedy, a little bit from King, a little bit from Malcolm, you see. But what we're so used to doing is throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Oh, he's a Republican, write him off. He's a Democrat, write him off. He's white, write him off. And there may be all sorts of good things coming out of this person, much we can learn, but if they aren't a member of our group, if we aren't affiliated with their sect, if we don't speak their dialect of English, then, oh, write them off. And we lose. You have two men. One has a parcel of land, the other has seed. When well, the man with a parcel of land says, well, you know what? You don't speak my dialect of English, so I'm not going to let you plant your seeds on my land. So the man with the seed says, oh, yeah, well, no big deal. You don't speak my dialect of English. You know what I mean? So I'm not going to plant my seeds on your land. And come spring, they find them both dead of starvation. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Because one's got the land, the other's got the seed. But they've got these things going on with each other which keeps them from coming together cooperatively and sharing the value that they both have. One has valuable seed, the other has the land. And without one without the other is worthless, you see. So they both die. They both starve to death. And so very often in our lives, that's what happens. We starve spiritually, uh, psychologically, emotionally, physically, because we're unwilling to exchange with people what we need because we are not a part of their group, you see. It's a dangerous way to live. So I suggest that we be pragmatic. And if we see a person with some seed, and I know I've got a little land. Well, if I don't have some land, I say, listen, you've got some seeds there. Could I get a couple of those, uh, you know? And maybe I can, you know, start my own garden. So I think patterning our lives after a specific person may be a mistake. I think we may be doomed for disappointment. But if we recognize that people are imperfect and we go about uh, gathering uh, what we can from people, from a gathering of heroes, we may be a lot better off. Does it all start with tolerance then? I think that's a major part of it. I think, and I think it, it, it starts with tolerance of ourselves. You know, there are days when I'm intolerant. There are days when I pull into a gas station in California and I'm looking for directions. And it seems that people in the gas station don't know where they are, let alone where I need to get to. See, I grew up in a place where you could always count on directions at a service station, at a filling station. You could get your car fixed, you could get water, you could get air. For me, a service station was a landmark, and it was a place where the people who worked there knew their community. So today, I live in an area that has a very new immigrant population. Where I grew up, we didn't have a new immigrant. All the immigrants were old immigrants, and everybody in the community was an immigrant or a descendant of an immigrant, but it was, they were old immigrants. So I now live in a community where there are a lot of new immigrants. And I'll pull into a gas station and, and I'm rustling for directions and no one can tell me where I need to go and I'll get upset. And I'll say, oh man, these people. 
all these people? Why don't they learn to speak English? Why don't they go back where they came from? They don't even know, you know, oh man, pity. Goes through my head like a shotgun blast. And then two or three minutes later, I say, hmm, what's that all about, pal? You know, what's it all about? These people go back where you came from. Need to learn to speak the language. We're a nation of immigrants, voluntary or involuntary. That's what we are. There was a time when my descendants uh, <laughs> didn't know where they were. Um, didn't want to be where they were. So I have to be tolerant of myself, knowing that I'm going to, I'm not going to beat myself up and beat myself over the head with a baseball bat, but I'm going to be aware that I can be intolerant. And I have to be tolerant of myself to work with that, to work on that. And it will get better over time, and it has gotten better over time. And I need to be not only tolerant of other people. St. Francis Assisi said in his prayer uh, that it is better to understand than to be understood if one wishes to be a channel of peace. So, an indifference is the other, uh, I think, great scourge. Elie Wiesel says that uh, he's a great Nobel laureate, uh, writer, Holocaust survivor, says that the opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference that indifference is more dangerous uh, than hatred. And that is the other thing I have to be on guard for, indifference. Well, it's not me being beaten, it's not my family, it's not the guys in my, on my soccer team. No. Hey, it's not my business. That is what is dangerous for us. So intolerance and indifference. Uh, right now, uh, you hear the naysayers, the media, I hate to bring the media up, but uh, specifically the media pro projects a negative image. Uh, the teenagers of America are apathetic. They don't care about anything. They, uh, they don't hold any values dear. Uh, what do you feel about that? I think to a large degree, the news is the news. Uh, it used to be the news was what was happening, but now the news is the news. And we must understand that the media is a profit based, are profit-based organizations. They're in business to make money. It is perhaps easier to make money feeding a people images that they will more readily accept than it is to feed them images that require them to think or wrestle with. It is perhaps easier to go along with the popular mindset than to be about the business of changing minds. Certainly, if I wish a greater constituency, a greater demographic, a bigger audience, what will I do? Show that audience things, images they're not familiar with? Or show them images that they're already comfortable with? So they can tune to my station. They can tune to my station and say, oh, this is my station because I'm comfortable with the images. No one likes change. So it's easier to make money by um, showing images that people are familiar with. Uh, I think that's one thing we need to understand. Uh, the youth of America, oh, the youth of America is no different than it's ever been. Um, the youth of America is always, uh, it, is, it is natural for youth to be at odds with age and for age to be at odds with youth. <laughs> that is the nature of things. Uh, each generation says, oh, those kids today were like when we grew up. I don't know how it is that we come of age and seem to forget we were 16 and 12. And it's a weird thing, you know. Uh, it's a very strange thing. I don't think, I think the youth today face new challenges. We all face new challenges. Uh, the information superhighway, the speed with which information is transmitted from one person to another, the modes of, of transmission uh, mean that uh, genocide uh, and madness can also be uh, disseminated much more quickly. Uh, and I think that's our current danger. Okay, Mr. Williams, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.